Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here bright and early. So uh, I guess we were the people that missed the after party yes yesterday, right? <laughs> so my name is Devyani Lal, and I'm here from Mayo Clinic uh, in the US. And today, I'm going to share with you how I approach frontal sinus surgery. And so we have 45 minutes, and I think that we have a variety of uh, people over here in the audience, and just like an informal poll, um, how many people here are residents or beginners in frontal sinus surgery? Perfect. And how many are masters? Can I ask you to leave the room? <laughs> OK. So um, hopefully, you know, I can segue between the simple um, and a little bit more complex. And, um, you know, I think we have 15 minutes between the start of the plenary session and, and, and the finish of this one. So perhaps if someone has individual questions, we can move aside to the side and talk about it. So um, a lot of the concepts I'm presenting, uh, I have a disclosure, will be published shortly uh, later this year in a book by Springer. And... Um, my mentor, Peter Huang, uh, who I spent a year with at Stanford several, several years ago, um, he and I are co-authors. So uh, we will break down the concepts into three uh, basic uh, fundamentals. One, the first thing I would do is to identify and understand the anatomy that is pertinent to that patient. There are obviously some universal concepts uh, but it is important to understand not just the anatomy, but the pathology that uh, one has to address. And the location of the pathology and the anatomy will determine what sort of approach we're going to take to the frontal sinus, what kind of procedure uh, that person and the disease process needs. And then hopefully I'll be able to convey the importance of not just meticulous dissection, but having a systematic plan and a systematic approach uh, to attacking uh, that disease uh, process. So we're all familiar with uh, this particular picture. Um, we know what the boundaries of the frontal recess are. And so anteriorly, there are absolute boundaries. You have a projection of bone, which is the nasal beak. Posteriorly, you have the skull base, the posterior frontal table that transitions back into that anterior ethmoidal skull base. So these are absolute boundaries. Laterally, towards the other side of the picture, is the eye. And then medially, where we can't see, is the middle turbinate. Anteriorly, we know that there are cells and structures and an amount of bone called the agonese, which when it gets pneumatized, is called the agonese cell. And posteriorly, you have the buller complex. And these are sort of the boundaries of the frontal recess. And notice that I use the term frontal recess. I don't use the term frontal duct, because there is actually not a duct. So the frontal recess is actually a potential space. And this potential space is an hourglass structure. The port which is above this narrowed area, which we conventionally refer to as an ostium, is called the frontal infundibulum. And the port below this ostium area, below here, is known as the frontal recess. And the entire pathway is known as the frontal sinus drainage pathway. So conventionally, the narrowest area here is about 3 to 4 millimeters, and we call it the frontal ostium. Uh, but there is not an ostium that you can find when you look in there, like when you see one in the sphenoid and the, or in the maxillary sinuses. So just be aware of that, that you're not going to find something like that. So our goal is to drain that frontal sinus through this convoluted hourglass-shaped structure into the nose. And what we understand by looking at the sagittal view is that actually it is removal of these surrounding structures uh, that is going to widen this frontal sinus recess. There's not a duct that will dilate or widen. This is a cartoon that is familiar to all. And what it is showing is the importance of understanding how the uncinate process actually affects the drainage pathway of the frontal sinus. So there are two spaces that are important. One is the infundibulum, and the other at the middle is the middle meatus. So if the uncinate process goes and attaches to the lamina papyracea or laterally to the bulla, then you can see naturally the frontal sinus will have to drain medial to this uncinate process. Now the space which is medial to this uncinate process between the uncinate process 
and this middle turbinate is actually called the middle meatus. We all know that the middle meatus is a space lateral to the middle turbinate. This is the most common scenario in human beings, and about two-thirds of us will probably have that drainage pathway. In certain patients, however, you'll find it either attaching to the skull base or to the middle turbinate. And when that happens, the frontal sinus has to drain lateral to the uncinate process. Now, the space that is lateral to the uncinate process between the uncinate and the lamina papyracea is the infundibulum. And so in one-third of patients, when the uncinate attaches to either the skull base or the middle turbinate, the drainage pathway is lateral to the uncinate process into the infundibulum. And the importance of this is that if your drainage pathway is lateral and you take a probe and go in through here, you're gonna end up in the anterior cranial fossa, which probably is not gonna be a popular move. So for the residents in the room, I always had a big problem understanding what the infundibulum is. So this is actually the left side, okay? So this is the lateral wall. This is the middle turbinate. Your septum is somewhere here. This is the uncinate process, this line we know, conventionally call the anterior maxillary line. And so the uncinate process is a sickle-shaped bone, and this line is called the, uh, between the uncinate and the bulla is called the hiatus, semilunaris. If you pass a probe lateral to the uncinate process through this hiatus semilunaris, you end up in this space that runs all the way between the uncinate process and the eye. And that is the infundibulum. So very important concept is whether you're going to put a frontal probe, medial or lateral, to that uncinate process. So as I said, to understand how you're going to approach opening up the frontal sinus, we have to identify the cells that are anterior and posterior to it. And these are all the anterior superior ethmoidal cells. And so if we dissect all these cells completely, and even if we don't widen up this area that we named the frontal osteum, we're still going to have a pretty wide frontal sinus drainage pathway. And that procedure where we just remove all the cells without actually formally opening up the frontal osteum is called a draft one procedure. So here we go, we'll remove the anterior cells, the posterior cells, and we'll end up with a draft one procedure. So, in order to remove these cells completely, we need to understand what kind of cells they are and how many cells they are. And Professor Kuhn was the first one to actually name these cells. So anteriorly, you have the agar cells, and cells on top of the agar cells are called type 1 to type 4 cells. And then posteriorly, you have the Buller complex. So you have the Buller ethmoidalis, and you may have several cells above the Buller. And they are called the suprabullar and the suprabullar frontal cells if they extend into the frontal uh, sinus posterior table. It's important to recognize when these cells are present. So if you have a cell that pneumatizes into the frontal sinus, like a type 3 cell or a large type 4 cell, then this is going to take you a lot more time to dissect. And you have to plan for that and plan for instrumentation. And potentially, if you have pathology that is isolated and really high, you may even have to consent your patient for a trephination or an above and below approach. This has been recently modified. And this is what I use to teach my uh, residents now. This is a fairly recent uh, paper uh, that came from uh, PJ Warmall's group. And uh, Peter Wong is one of the co-authors. And what this did is simplify the nomenclature. So you have an agonese cell anteriorly, and cells on top of the agonese cell are called supra-agar cells. And if these supra-agar cells nematize above the frontal osseum into the frontal sinus itself, then they name it the supra-agar frontal cells. So easy to understand. And likewise with the bulla, if you have a cell above it, supra-bullar cell, if that supra-bullar cell nematizes into the frontal sinus itself, it's a supra-bullar frontal cell. And then you have the interceptal cell, which is now named the frontal septal cell, and it's important to recognize how that might affect the drainage pathway. The other thing I always look for is something called a supraorbital ethmoidal cell that is often an overlooked cell, and it's important to recognize what this cell is. So if you look at a coronal view and you say, hey, there's a partition in the frontal sinus, then start thinking of a supraorbital ethmoidal cell. So what is that? So see here, there is the frontal sinus that pneumatizes above the orbit. We all are familiar with that anatomy. Sometimes there's a cell behind the frontal sinus that also does the same, and they are separated by a partition. 
And this is best viewed in a parasagittal section. So you can see this, the frontal sinus and behind it is another cell pneumatizing into the orbital plate, and that is the supraorbital frontal cell. Why is it important? Well, sometimes you can have disease localized in this supraorbital cell, and this patient had actually had several endoscopic procedures and an open procedure to address this pathology, which was actually far posterior to the frontal sinus, and the previous surgeon could not actually address it. So you might have disease that is isolated in the supraorbital cell. So how does it appear? Now you see this partition. This is an axial section. So you can see that on this cartoon, this is the frontal sinus and this is the supraorbital ethmoidal cell. And this cell is actually more posterior and more lateral to the true frontal sinus. And this is the endoscopic correlate of how these open. This is the left side and this is using a 70 degree endoscope to look up there. So this is the septum. This is a frontal sinus opening, partition, and then you have a supraorbital cell. Be behind the first supraorbital ethmoidal cell is a structure that you don't want to hit, and that is the anterior ethmoidal artery. So some old publications call the anterior ethmoidal artery to lie between the frontal sinus and the supraorbital cell. It actually is behind the first supraorbital cell. You can have multiple supraorbital cells going behind from the posterior ethmoidal complex too. Uh, but the, this anterior ethmoidal artery is usually above the bulla and behind the first supraorbital cell and not in this partition here. So the importance of uh, finding this supraorbital ethmoidal cell is that these cells are usually present when the ethmoid sinus is very hyperneumatized. And in this situation, you'll often encounter what we call a pedicle ethmoidal artery, and this is something that you don't want to hit. So you, again, you see these partitions, and this patient has actually three or four um, supraorbital ethmoidal cells. You can see the frontal, and you see the supraorbital ethmoid. And behind the first supraorbital ethmoid pedicle on a, on a mesentery is your anterior ethmoidal artery. Notice that the anterior ethmoidal artery is not at the junction of the frontal and the ethmoid, but it's a little bit behind. So why is this important? So look at this patient with massive polyposis, and you see um, that you have a pedicle ethmoidal artery. You also have disease in that supraorbital ethmoidal cell. So if you think that you have a pedicle ethmoidal artery, um, you know you should always have a bipolar that is angled and uh, available in the room. But certainly in this situation, you might want to just make sure with your staff in the OR that you do have it handy in case you inadvertently injure it. And you want to use a bipolar artery over here, not a monopolar, because you can actually crack the skull base with the heat and cause a CSF leak. So why do we need to know about all these cells? Well, a um, you know you have to dissect those to get into the frontal sinus. But B, if you don't address them completely, then these are often the, uh, the cause of failed frontal sinus surgery. So let's look at these sagittal sections. Here we have frontal sinus disease and lots of ethmoidal partitions, right? So not completely dissected. We didn't even perform a draft one or a draft two A procedure over here. Over here, again, you see the same situation. Here you have an incomplete dissection of potentially an organizi cell, and it's formed a mucosal that has not plugged up this cell. Uh, over here you have that um, superbullar frontal cell that is now plugging up this area of the frontal sinus, and everything else appears relatively healthy. And over here, probably some soft tissue stenosis between residual ethmoidal partitions, uh, stub of the middle turbinate, and uh, obscuring the frontal sinus. And so these are important to recognize. So with that, let's go back and see how we're going to use all this information uh, to actually dissect into the frontal sinus. So let's look at this case where the frontal, uh, where the uncinate process goes and attaches um, medially towards the skull base or to the middle turbinate, right over here. And so we know from what we talked about that the frontal sinus will drain lateral to this uncinate process in the space that we just call the infundibulum. And so our boundaries laterally are the lamina papyracea. We'll encounter all those anterior superior ethmoidal cells we talked about. Immediately, we have to be careful because we have the cribriform, and it is this thinnest part of the cribriform called the lateral lamella of the cribriform, which is about a sixth of a millimeter thin in certain patients that we have to deal with as we go and dissect into this frontal sinus. So this is the cartoon representation. So we'll say this is going towards the middle turbinate, and we're going to have a drainage pathway into the infundibulum. 
So the next thing I'll do is to count the cells that I have to encounter. So here, let's say we have an organizing cell and we have a Buller complex and I'll go count the cells that are anterior and then we'll count the cells posterior to it. And then we're gonna use the organizing cell, and this was described beautifully by P.J. Wormel, and that's how I approach my frontal sinuses and locate the uncinate process. So let's put that cartoon together again. So we have the uncinate process that is going towards the millitrivenate. It's important to start identifying the radiographic correlates to everything that we identify on the CT scan with the endoscopic view. So here's the left side again. So here's the middle turbinant. This is the axilla. The axilla is the area where the middle turbinant goes and joins the lateral wall. Typically, if you open up the axilla, uh, you're gonna open up into the anterior portion of the organizing cell. The advantage of opening this early is that you have to use less angle scopes. And also, for me personally, I find it a much easier way to tackle the frontal sinus, and sometimes you could do a lot of the dissection using zero and 30 degree endoscopes rather than using a 70 working under this axilla. So I'm gonna look for the attachment of the uncinate process. So here's the uncinate, uh, here's the axilla, and here's the uncinate process. And if you conduct your dissection slowly and meticulously with sharp instruments, you can actually identify all these lamella in there. So I've opened up the organizing, and then uh, I will usually use a kerosene punch to open this. And then here's the uncinate process. Now if I go in through here, then I'm gonna end up here, all right? So I'll end up in the anterior cranial fossa where I want to end up is actually lateral to the uncinate process. And you want to end up behind the agar nasi cell because we know that the frontal recess is behind the agar uh, nasi cell and, and, and it's between the agar nasi and the bulla, which is back here. So if I put a probe up here, I am going to go into that frontal sinus. So let's look at combining all those endoscopic correlates. So axilla, organizy cell, open the organizy cell with a kerosene and then follow up with a microdebrider. This is the cap of the organizy that Professor Stomberger and Kuhn have talked about uncapping with a curette. You can pass that probe we just talked about here into the infundibulum go all the way dilating it, never force an instrument through, otherwise you'll end up in the anterior cranial fossa or someplace bad, and then you'll take a curette, uncap this, and as you deliver this cap out, you have now finished up with a draft to a procedure, right? Um, and if you widen that frontal sinus ostium area, that narrow area, you will convert um, the draft to, um, sorry, you end up with a draft one procedure, and when you widen that formally, you end up with a draft 2A procedure. So this is a 70 degree view, looking into the frontal sinus, and here is the frontal sinus look, uh, as you look up. This is a very important landmark. This partition that you see in the roof of the frontal sinus, you will never see that in a type four cell or a type three cell. If you see that, and if you see transillumination right up in the top of the forehead, then you know you're in the true frontal sinus. There are partitions behind that one must clean up, especially in patients with polyps, and you must have a smooth transition here uh, uh, to um, have a great uh, frontal sinusotomy. So that's simple anatomy. What happens when you have lots of cells? How are you gonna address that? So this is a great publication that I would highly encourage you to download. Uh, this is called the Agar-Buller Classification. And this comes from Pierre and Nicolai's group. And what they talk about is, you know, oftentimes when I look into these CT scans, I don't know whether these are cells or these are spaces. And what these authors advocate for is just counting the number of cells and spaces. So you count the number of uh, cells or spaces anteriorly, and they call it A1, A2, or A3, if you have one, two, or three cells. Count the cells or spaces posteriorly, and you say B1, B2, or B3, depending on how many cells you have anteriorly or posteriorly. And then you have a plan of attack. You locate the uncinate attachment, so let's say that in this case it goes laterally uh, towards the lamina papyracea. Most people think that to be a good frontal sinus, well, I wouldn't say most people, many people think that to be a good frontal sinus surgeon, you must do a modified Lothrop or a draft to be in most of your patients, and actually that's not quite true. Most patients can be tackled very effectively with a draft 2A procedure, uh, which is basically just removing all the cells in the frontal sinus drainage pathway. And if you have to widen that ostium a little bit more, um, you know, you do that. But 
the majority of cases that I tackle even in my tertiary care revision practice, I end up mostly with standard endoscopic frontal techniques which are draft one or draft two A procedures. It's rare for me to do nothing because these patients have been through uh, the grinder in some cases, and I will do a fair number of 2B or, uh, and draft threes, but they are not the majority of my procedures. And then in certain procedures, I will um, uh, use some open techniques as well. So going back to um, the dissection we talked about, uh, here we have a preoperative CT review. I'm gonna count the number of cells that are in here. So I think there are three cells or spaces. Then I'll look at the posterior aspect, and in this situation, I think there are probably three cells or spaces. And uh, the unsinate process goes and attaches laterally towards the bulla, so my drainage pathway is gonna be more medial. So I usually do the um, frontal sinus uh, dissection um, after I finish sphenoethmidectomy. You saw me use a pledget, and that is soaked in epinephrine 1 in 1,000. And here I've left behind, as part of my ethmoidectomy, the top part of the unsinate process. And this will help me identify where the frontal recess is, which, as I know, um, is going to be between the agonese and the bulla. So here I took a kerosene, removed that front part, um, the top part of the infundibulum hasn't been opened up, and now I've opened up the front part of the agonese cell. So once I do that, I can see and this is the medial part, you have to be very careful using the microdebrider close to the orbit, always face it upward, and if you are not familiar with it, use handheld instruments. So now I'm gonna find the space between the agonese and the bulla, and I've deliberately chosen to show you a polyp case that is oozy and bloody. So here the frontal sinus probe is passed up, and so I'm now following up with a curette, and I'm removing that A1 cell, the agonese cell. So we put the curette in and uncap that agonese and remove the remnants of this very carefully. And so the microdebrider is used to complete that dissection. It isn't used to typically um, go ahead and um, um, initiate bony resection. And you can see me using hemostatic materials. I sometimes use hot irrigation. Um, now this is A2. And so, so that's the first superagar cell. I'll go ahead, and in the same process, I'm going to go ahead, use a frontal sinus curette, go in, take that cap out, and then remove it with a microdebrider. So now when you pass the frontal probe, it's hitting, and it's not going upward. And that's a sign that you're not into the true frontal recess, uh, true frontal sinus. Uh, because your probe should pass really freely if you're really into the true frontal sinus. So I know that looking at my CT, that's the uh, A3 or the superagar cell number two, and again, I go behind it with a probe, then follow through with the curette, uncap that last cell, and now you can see the true frontal sinus. Once I've done that, all the remnant um, uh, cells and partitions are removed. And now you have the posterior aspect, this, uh, the B1, B2, B3 complex remnants remaining behind. And so at this point, I've already identified the skull base behind in the sphenoid and the posterior ethmoid. I just go ahead, take a curette, come all the way up towards the frontal osseum carefully, visualizing this medial aspect, which is the lateral lamella of the uh, cribiform. So I use a lot of frontal through cutting instruments, a lot of angle instrumentation, and especially when you're medial around here, you don't want to be pushing things because you can easily create a CSF leak. And then we'll use angle microdebriders, and I will use a 40-degree microdebrider with a 30 or 45-degree endoscope, and then with the 70-degree, um, I use a 60-degree microdebrider. Finally, after I've done all the dissection, I'm going to use a lot of irrigation because I want to remove all the bone chips. If you want to you know, widen this more in the frontal sinus area, uh, ostium area, you can, and this is the frontal sinus, this is that partition we talked about, and that smooth transition uh, that we wanna see. So again, it's important to recognize that, okay, it's important to recognize uh, that the um, true frontal sinus, when you pass the probe, is gonna be able to pass very freely um, and in, in um, super agar cell, you'll hit, you'll hit a, a, a blind pouch and uh, don't push through it. Uh, 
So um, this is a well-healed draft 2A frontal osteoplasty. Uh, and then here you see the frontal sinus. Here you see the osteum area. A little bit of uh, scarring has formed. And then the anterior ethmoidal artery is one space behind there. So this is what a well-healed um, uh, sinus should look like. And if you don't clear the ethmoids, your frontal sinuses are not going to drain well. So good maxillary entrostomy, a large one in this case with polyps. Uh, here you can see that that's the infraorbital nerve. This is the lamina papyracea. This is the sphenoid. Then we have a very nice transition from the sphenoid skull base to the ethmoid skull base all the way up to that frontal sinus. So that smooth transition, that complete ethmoidectomy uh, uh, with removal of partitions along the lamina papyracea and the skull base are going to be critical to successful frontal sinusotomy. What is a draft 2B procedure? Well, a draft 2B procedure is when you um, make the widest possible unilateral frontal sinus opening. And you do that by going over the attachment of that uh, middle turbinate to the um, uh, frontal sinus floor. And I typically use a draft to be procedure sparing, and I use it in cases where there's lateralization of a remnant stub of the middle turbinate, so I have to remove that anyways. So I'll go ahead and remove this stub and then go all the way over to that interfrontal sinus septum or to the uh, nasal septum and widen it. So this is a patient uh, of a draft to be with drill out, and this is actually a patient with inverted papilloma. So um, there's inverted papilloma that is extending into uh, the medial part of the frontal sinus. So um, here there's some millimeter uh, polyposis. A draft frontal sinus, uh, sinusotomy has been uh, conducted. The uh, frontal um, mucosa is very, very irritable. And as we um, look in there, you can see that uh, this mucosa has been eroded. That's a little bit of the uh, papillo papilloma, which is now in the medial aspect that's being removed. Uh, the polypoid tissue is being removed. So in this situation, uh, because there's so much erosion on this posterior port of the frontal sinus, I'm really concerned that this is going to stenose down. And we know that the frontal osteum will nose down by about 30 to 50% and more so in highly inflamed uh, uh, cases. So then I make the decision to go ahead and create a very wide uh, uh, frontal sinusotomy. And because of the inflammation, I want to make the widest possible uh, drill out uh, that is uh, available to me. So I'll take a drill, I'll go to the nasal beak area, I'll drill that out, and then I have taken down that uh, attachment of that middle turbinate to the frontal sinus floor, and I'm gonna go ahead and go all the way over medially towards the nasal septum or the interfrontal sinus septum, and then you can put in a celastic stent, uh, and that is helpful to keep that open. We'll talk a little bit more about stents later on. What about endoscopic modified Lothrop approaches? In my practice, I use this for what I consider terminally diseased sinuses or in nasal polyposis patients that have demonstrated a failure to be controlled. The advantages in those situations are that it's easier to deliver drugs and clean uh, the patient's cavity out within the, uh, within, in, within the office itself. Um, however, I don't do it very frequently and I certainly don't do it as a first time procedure unless there are extenuating circumstances. So as an overview of the technique, what we are basically doing is removing that frontal sinus floor. We are taking this partition between the two frontal sinuses and the top part of the uh, septum, the anterior superior septum. And that leads to a really wide cavity or the widest possible cavity between the lamina papyraceas on both sides and anteriorly between the nasal beak area and posteriorly towards the posterior um, uh, frontal table and the ethmoidal skull base. So this can be approached in two ways. It's, it's up, one is called the inside out, where you get into the frontal osteum like I showed you, and then you drill outward, and that's called the inside out. And then the other procedure is the outside in technique where you actually drill laterally first and, um, and then start drilling medially and identify the frontal osteum uh, last of all. Now, most people get worried about removing the septum around here. You have to be careful that when you remove the septum, you're under the nasal bone 
and not in the cartilaginous sec uh, section. And if you don't extend your septectomy far anterior uh, to the vertical attachment of the middle turbinate, you're usually going to be safe. So this is a draft three procedure. This is one of the first few ones that I did out of fellowship. And I'm showing this because it's a difficult one. So there's osteitis in this lady. This is actually a stent. I had to put it in the office of a pyomucosile. So here, what we are doing is resecting that attachment of the middle turbinate to the floor, just like we do in a draft 2B procedure. So this is the left side. You don't want to go too far posteriorly because that's where the middle turbinate attaches to the skull base. So on the left side, we had an, um, a relatively healthy frontal sinus, so I'm going to go ahead and identify the frontal ostium. And now I'm removing that anterior superior port of the uh, nasal septum, and I can go from one side to the other. We're trying to remove that osteotic bone, which was in the right frontal recess, using a 45-degree endoscope and angle instrumentation. That's a Hoseman punch. It's really hard for me to get through that bone, so now what I'm doing is exploiting that left frontal uh, sinus opening I've created, and I will come from the left to the right side. And this is a cutting burr. Uh, we now have drill systems uh, that rotate at uh, 30,000. Uh, I like those better. And this is a 12K system, and it takes me a longer time, but it's nice for purposes of demonstration. So what I have done is now open up the left, remove the uh, partition between the left and the right. But I, in, in that frontal recess area, I still have the thick bone. So now what I'm going to do is drill out that thick bone and that right frontal recess area, and that's dense osteitis. So you can see I'm using angle instrumentation because it's really, really high up. And once I drill all the way up, I'm finally down to the, uh, or up to the floor of that right frontal sinus, and you can see the mucosa there, and I've got this thick bone. This bone is usually uh, just anterior to the anterior projection of the cribriform, so we have to be careful as we start drilling it. And so initially, I'm using a cutting burr. But I get, as I get closer uh, to that posterior table, uh, there's projections of the cribriform on either side. I'm going to be very, very careful, and I'm going to use a diamond burr. And this is a coarse diamond burr. So um, you want to drill as far behind as the first olfactory phylum, certainly not through it. You can use the image guidance, and, um, and in the next video, I'll show you how to identify the olfactory phylum. So I've finished up here, and this is a 70 degree view of this um, frontal uh, sinus. And you can see the limits of the neoosteum, far lateral, um, this was before the days of drug eluting stents, but I still like to use this reinforced elastic stent. So this is her uh, immediately post-op after I finish drilling, and then this is her six months post-op. You can see a little bit of stenosis, but for most it's open. So for the draft three procedure um, in the inside-out technique, uh, there are certain contraindications. If you've got a really um, what, um, narrow width to the frontal sinus, it's going to be hard to put up drills and drill out. And so in, in these situations, um, you can't do that uh, inside-out approach. You can do it when you have wider openings. This is still going to be a little hard, but at least you've got a thick nasal beak that you can drill out instead of banging into the posterior frontal table. So um, that's where, you know, the outside-in technique is really very useful, and I've actually transitioned my practice for the last year or so to ex almost exclusively be doing these outside-in techniques. And what we are doing with this outside-in technique is instead of finding the osteum, you find the nasal beak, drill that out. You find the lateral port, which is the frontal process of the maxilla, and uh, you drill that out. And then you drill out the floor, and once you've opened up everything, and the last thing you do is find the frontal osteum. And the advantage is because you haven't really opened up the frontal osseum and you're not drilling inside and drilling um, uh, mucosa, it's less bloody. And the other advantage is you end up using zero degree endoscopes. So if you are working really high up, you can use a 30 degree endoscope. So I really like this procedure very much. The principles and the boundaries remain the same. So 
In those contraindications that I showed you, sometimes in narrow uh, frontal sinuses where I said we couldn't do it, uh, with the outside in, I have been able to actually successfully do uh, this procedure. So this is a recent uh, procedure that I did last year or so. So you can see very small uh, uh, frontal sinuses. And I actually operated on this lady and did conventional uh, frontal sinusotomy. I was not very successful, you can see, in clearing up this frontal sinus. And you can see that the reason I didn't undertake an outside, inside out is it's very narrow width over here. So I use the image guidance. I come under the nasal beak area. You uh, have the lateral limits, which is the frontal process of the maxilla. You get the endoscopic correlates of all of these structures. And in this situation, the first thing you do is to create an anterior superior septectomy, and you come under uh, and um, remove that area of the uh, septum. The next thing you do is remove the mucosa over the uh, frontal process of the maxilla. I like to use a zero degree endoscope um, and just a, a needle tip bovi to do this. And so you can see, you can actually preserve this mucosa and you can use this for grafting within the um, uh, modified Lothrop cavity after you've finished. And so again, uh, you're gonna use and recheck, make sure that you're within the boundary. So what I'm doing now, this is working on the right side, I'm pushing that flap backwards and as I do so, this is the septum. As you push it back, you'll start seeing these little strands. And the first strand that you see is actually a vessel. And the second strand that you, as you pull in is going to be the first olfactory pilum. So um, you can remove this mucosa or you can harvest it, uh, depending on what your needs are. And then you go ahead, do the same thing on the other side. This is the left side. And I'm going to uh, remove the mucosa and I'm now drilling out. You then drill out the bone of the um, septum, and then this is a very narrow cavity, um, and this was the first case that I actually used this um, outside-in technique. So I've drilled everything. I'm not looking for my frontal osteum. I've removed the septum, and now I've found the floor of the frontal sinus. So if you follow the septum up, you'll find the floor of the frontal sinus. I typically don't want to open this mucosa here. I'll just continue to thin out bone here. You can see that movement of the medial canthal skin And that's on the other side. And now finally, after I've found the limits on both sides, I'm gonna go ahead and start drilling out the floor of the frontal sinus. You can see this, there's impacted debris in there. Uh, and even though I had a perfectly patent frontal sinusotomy, it was not adequate for that. So I still haven't found my, um, my opening that I had created previously, and I'm not even worrying about it. All I'm doing is creating a nicely marsupialized shallow cavity by drilling out bone as far lateral as I can go. And the last thing I'm doing is actually finding my frontal um, uh, osseum that I had created, which is usually the more posterior part of the frontal sinus, and then you connect the two and you have a modified Lothrop cavity. Here's the um, graft that I harvested, and, and here you can see that I'm actually using a drug looting stent, it, uh, especially in narrow cavities. It conforms to that area very nicely and heals up uh, pretty well as well. So. so let's do a case now. Uh, this is a case of a gentleman who underwent an uh, obliteration procedure um, several years ago uh, for mucoceles, and then presented again with multiple mucoceles. You can see that one, two, three, extensive erosion of the posterior frontal table getting into the orbit. So what do you do at this point of time? I mean, in the old days, people would said, do obliteration procedure again. I think we've kind of moved away from it. The problems with the obliteration procedure in this person is, is quite, um, it's actually going to be very difficult because you can see, A, there are multiple mucoceles, B, that the mucosa is right over the dura, as well as uh, the area of the periorbita. So stripping that completely, not getting into a massive CSF leak, and not ending up with an obliteration procedure is going to be hard. So here's how uh, we attacked it. So what I did was a standard endoscopic approach, open up the frontal sinus, and then went through a brow trephination, and you go through the brow and attack the lateral mucoceles, which are protruding into the eye. So this is actually looking through the trephination with a pediatric endoscope, and you can use your standard uh, instrumentation to get in and open up all the partitions in there. <laughs> 
And so this is the above and below approach. So here you see this is a 70 degree view looking into the right frontal, left frontal. And um, this is from his previous procedure that put in some sort of plate in the back. You can see those plates. And we got a really good uh, um, marsupialization of all the mucoseals, as you can see from this post-operative MRI. What you see here is actually CSF on this uh, T1-weighted image. Uh, the brain had been pushed back and compressed by this mucus seal, so now it's just um, filled in with uh, fluid, and you can see that as well. So you can do a lot of work with trephination, especially if the mucus seals are far lateral or superior, and uh, the frontal trephination is a technique that is often overlooked in frontal sinusotomy, so I wanted to throw in a uh, small plug in there. I get a lot of questions when I do my courses about what about stents, right? So I showed you one situation where I used a stent where the mucosa was friable, inflamed, I had drilled out bone. And you can see that the opening there is actually quite big. I'm not using that to dilate the opening. I'm using that celastic to actually hydrate that area. And this is when I take it out. It looks like it has mucosalized really nicely. And this is a draft to be, so you see that half horseshoe shaped appearance. So in my practice, uh, the frontal um, uh, sinus stenting is something that I use in a limited fashion. So I will usually use it if I have a lot of bare bone. I uh, sometimes use the drug looting stents if I have lots of inflamed mucosa. And particularly if you have a very narrow frontal recess, you really can't put in a celastic stent because it's bulky. And so in those situations, uh, with the commercially available drug looting stents, you can actually deploy them in narrower uh, cases. So a lot of people have talked about using them routinely. That's certainly not my practice. I just came from our ARS meeting, and there was a study um, that compared celastic stents versus drug looting stents, and they found better outcomes in terms of olfaction. I'll wait for the actual paper to come out before I change my practice. Uh, these stents are useful, especially the uh, drug looting stents. You saw me use that to hold the mucosal graft in position. So, it's important because the technician is only as good as their tool. So lots of powered instrumentation, um, a micro debrider uh, drills if you want to do draft two Bs or draft threes, but these are the basics. Different angle uh, frontal sinus seekers, bent sideways, bent backwards. I love these malleable suctions. You can use them, connect them to a syringe and irrigate through them. You can bend them to different angles. And then a lot of angled um, uh, suction tips. These were the, uh, the punches. These are like mushroom punches, but this is spring-loaded. And so I love these. This is really great for uh, thick bone. And this is actually very nice if you have to work higher up in the frontal sinus. These are angled kerosens, or sometimes called cobras, uh, which are really good to remove the axilla or thick bone anteriorly. And then have a variety of instrumentation that is angled. And these, you can see, these are through-cutting instruments opening uh, to different size. They come in 45 degrees, 60 degree, 90 degree. The more frontal sinus surgery you do, uh, the more it is useful to have them. And certainly having a few of these instruments in your clinic is also important because it helps you do post-operative debridement. Got it. Um, uh, post-operative debridement, and, um, and, and you can actually remove scar tissue and early granulation tissue, bone chips, etc. So I'd highly encourage you to have these uh, in the office as well. So um, we do a course every year. You're welcome to come in and join us in 2019. Our dates are March 28th to the 30th. Um, I, I don't know how many of you do balloon dilatation. I do it in a very limited circumstance um, in, in very few of my patients. Um, you know, this is how it, I put this slide in because you can see how a transelimination into a true frontal sinus looks like. If you just get transelimination over here, it's really probably into an anterosuperior ethmoidal cell, not the true frontal sinus. Uh, we can use the balloon for dilating scars or um, in, you know, sometimes if you have a very narrow frontal recess, you can snake in a balloon and you can uh, pass that along and it can help you with the dilatation. So that's the extent of where I would use a balloon, and you can see that I'm having a lot of trouble passing this instrument and probe in there. And so here, you can put in a balloon, be careful, because you can create damage with any instrument if it's not um, uh, used carefully. And so the hydraulic action of the balloon gives you a wider passage, as you can see it in this patient. And then sometimes you can use the balloon, uh, especially in this patient uh, that has a lot of mucus and um, uh, allergic mucin in there. You can pass a balloon. Uh, 
And then you can actually irrigate uh, through some of these balloon dilatation systems uh, that are available. And that's something that you can do in the office. You can also dilate uh, scar tissue within the office itself. I am not a heavy balloon user. My practice is a different sort of a practice. Um, I think that to do a good balloon uh, frontal sinusotomy, you actually have to have a better understanding of the anatomy uh, than with conventional, because you can, uh, you can do a fair amount of damage with the balloon itself. So open frontals have the limited indications. Um, we use them sparingly. This is a patient that underwent a Riddell's approach. And uh, more about that. And with that, I have been given my time out. And I invite you to this course. And I got just done in time. Thank you for your attention.